Hello and welcome to another edition of Economic Outlook. I'm your host, Phil D'Amico. What makes an entrepreneur? Why is entrepreneurial success so hard to achieve? This week, we will discuss what it means to be an entrepreneur on the next Economic Outlook. I'm Phil D'Amico. Whether we're exploring Michiana's business environment, our community at large, or covering the region's complex economy, Economic Outlook is where we explore the economy, education, manufacturing, and new business models. My job is to go beyond the numbers and corporate analysis as we invite some of the best experts to answer the hard questions that face our economy. This is Economic Outlook. According to Forbes magazine, seven out of every 10 businesses that start up survive two years, half survive five years, one third at least 10 years, and one quarter at least 15 years or more. Also referenced is that only 39% of all small businesses will make money in the lifetime of their business with 30% breaking even and another 30% will lose money over their existence. However, the number of U.S. patents filed has made a resurgence over the last 10 years with U.S. and China leading the world in number of patents filed. So entrepreneurial success is growing. This week, local and regional entrepreneurs provide their thoughts and insights on what it takes to be an entrepreneur. We invite to the program Jim Hammer, President and CEO of Imagineering Finishing Technologies. Dan Schmittendorf is the President and CEO of Communication Company of South Bend. David Roy is President of Lake Michigan Mailers. And Matt Huntsberger is Managing Partner of Sprint Guard. Welcome to all of you. It's great to have you. A lot of presidents in there. I feel like we should play Hail to the Chief or something. But, you know, but it's interesting, Dave, some of those thoughts on there. Give me your thoughts. It's got to be so hard to be an entrepreneur today. Well, the, the stats that you read are very daunting. Uh, it, and, and to the faint of heart, I think they would look at that and say, the last thing I want to do is start my own sure. business. Yeah. Uh, but I think for, uh, for the entrepreneur, the person who's got the, the fire in their belly that says, I have an idea. I have an improvement on, on something that's already existing. I have a new product. I have a new service. Uh, that's something that isn't easily uh, uh, quelched. Mm -hmm. and, and it's something that uh, needs to be fostered and, and developed. Uh, and uh, it's something that if, if you can plan for it and if you can stick it out through the tough times, it can be a very rewarding experience. Yeah, there's a different mentality though, correct? I mean, a lot to what David's talking about, Dan, there's a different mentality to being an entrepreneur. Oh, absolutely, and there's different levels of entrepreneurship too. I mean, you could have an entrepreneur that's inside another company, but they have the ability to see that opportunity and, and, and grab something and make it happen. And then there's the, the, the person that, is an entrepreneur that wants to start up a, a company um, or, or a brand new product and take it to market. So I think that there's different levels of that, but <clears throat> um, it is daunting to hear those uh, uh, statistics because you know it does make people not want to take on that risk. But I think that that's the separation of an entrepreneur is they're, they see the opportunity, but they're willing to take the risk and they have the passion and the uh, drive to do so. Yeah, it's interesting. We're all sports fans here. I, I had an entrepreneur tell me once, you know, being an entrepreneur is a lot like a defensive back. You might get burned once in a while deep, but you got to forget about that play and move on to the next. But there is a mentality of, you know, you've, you've got to just kind of maintain your focus, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, being a businessman is like being a coach right. and a teacher. And, uh, you know, the entrepreneur, as we mentioned here, is the, the passion it takes to, uh, and the commitment to um, achieve all the objectives that you set forth. And then the hard part is competition. Right. and uh, the other constraints that you might be faced with. Mm. And I think what entrepreneurs do well is that they probably put a little bit of a blinder on some of those things. And, uh, but technically, I think they, they have plan in place to deal with those things. And uh, because the companies that are around 50, 60 years, um, you know, they've proven that they have the ability to um, um, you know, weather those right. things. Yeah. And, but it takes a team to make it happen. So I think entrepreneurs, you know, the, the successful ones recognize that. And uh, it's all about getting the right talent in the right place. Yeah, and you can't be afraid to fail, right, man? I mean, fear of failure is not even in the equation. No, absolutely not. I mean, you guys have touched on great points. You know, being a basketball coach, you know, you, you set forth a plan, sure. you choose your team, and there are tough times. So you have to ride those out. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, you just have to have that grit. Yeah, and, it, and you talked about the daunting stats. You, you gotta get past those and forget about the risk, correct? Or I mean, you, you maybe look at strategically that that's part of it, but you gotta get past that, I think. I would agree, and I think most entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs that I know, 
are not, would never describe themselves as gamblers. Right. These are not people who are simply uh, rolling the dice and taking their chances. Right. These are people who have planned something out and said, here's what I want to achieve, here's what we're going to achieve as a group, here's what we're going to do as a community, and then we're going to follow that plan. I think they are risk, they tend to be risk tolerant. Uh, I think they have a, the ability to look at that and say, I'm making an investment in myself, I'm making an investment in my company, so if I'm not getting paid this weekend uh, because I have to take that money and put it into something else, or I have to use it to buy inventory, whatever those, uh, whatever those challenges might be, they can see the long-term goal and, and, and accept the risk that they're willing, that they're gonna be facing, mm -hmm. rather than simply just gambling. Yeah, and I think Dave brings up a good point. Now you have several individuals working for you. A lot of the decisions you make now affect not only your organization, not only you, but your organization as a whole, correct? So you gotta, you gotta think more than just yourself now, I'm, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely, and that does add to the stress level, right. for sure. But, you know, if you, <clears throat> as you start out, it, you know, you have that passion and you see the opportunity, and if you, if you do design that perfect plan or one that you did your research and you, and you find out the market research and, and where the successes are gonna lie and you build that business plan and then you, <clears throat> find the right people and like uh, Jim Collins book good to great yeah. get the right people on the bus and put them in the right seats then you're going to be more successful but I agree you are definitely uh, risk tolerant but I, I I agree that the successful ones are not gamblers yeah. because they understand the risk going in because there's a lot of sacrifice that has to happen I mean you might have that weekend or that week or that month or that year where you don't make any income right well, yeah, I, I think the uh, successful entrepreneur really identifies and recognizes that the, the, there are risks that you know, they have to build the team to uh, 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 be successful. And um, you know, companies go through growth stages, and uh, just like teams. And um, you know, the last year's uh, group, you might need a few more mm -hmm. uh, uh, skill sets for the future. And you have to plan for that. So what someone said earlier was you can't be selfish. You, know, you, you have to put the investment up front and uh, Many times there's not a, uh, you know, it doesn't happen today, the return on investment will happen down the road. So, you know, taking risks, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, there's, there's risks in many of the things that we do in life sure. we have to identify with. In business, um, the timing of those things are some things that we, we don't always control. Yeah, and I think what's interesting, Jim brought up, Matt, the, the growth aspect. I think with every growth stage, there's, there comes new sets of issues, risks, and those kind of things you look at. Well, absolutely. You know, and I relate my business experience sure. uh, back to being a basketball coach, you know, and, and building that team. There's always risk when you're recruiting at the college level. You're always risking on a player. Um, you know, a new season brings new challenges, um, just like with business. So you're always looking to prepare and minimize the risks. We talked about risks. I like that what you said about, you know, we're not, I don't, I don't think of myself as a gambler. Right. You know, I like to look at the risk and try and minimize sure. it by preparing and, and looking ahead and how to, how to sidestep that if possible. Yeah, so. good point. So what are some of the big challenges here? I mean, besides risk and those kind of things, what are some of the challenges that face you on a daily basis? Well, I think for, for any entrepreneur, it, managing that growth can be a, a massive uh, challenge. Mm. And ma growth has to be managed. You have to anticipate that you're going to grow and you have to manage it. Uh, I know a number of entrepreneurs who um, own uh, a company and their, their idea of growth is being able to get to a point where they can take three weeks vacation and go snowmobiling. Uh, others <laughs> are looking at this saying, if I'm not hitting 30% growth, then I'm, then I'm shrinking. Uh, you have to be able to manage that growth. And you have to be able to have the people in place to, to be able to grow with you. Mm. And it's not uncommon for a company, particularly in the startup stage, to outgrow key people either skill set or attitude who can't keep up with the vision or uh, the, the, the ultimate destination of the company. Yeah, your thoughts on, on that maybe and, and some of the challenges maybe oh, today's Absolutely, and, and going back to being a startup company, when you, when you begin, <clears throat> you could easily outgrow the talent because you're at a certain level and you're trying sure. to recruit around that level and that funding that you have available. So I said, you know, get the right people on the bus, but in the beginning you don't have the funding necessarily, mm -hmm. may, possibly, to get the right people, those, those people that will take you to that type of a level. And if you have that concept and in, in, in your plan of what level that means, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges is finding that talent. Um, it, it's difficult. I think that's probably our biggest challenge is finding the talent when we decide we're going to hire for a position. Yeah, I know you're constantly looking for that as well, right, Jim, as your sure. talent. Is that, is that one of your biggest challenges? I, I think talent, uh, uh, certainly the, one of the other um, 
challenges is making sure that your your market uh, ability is uh, you know mm -hmm. is is in the eyes of the customer it's something that's sustainable sure. it's something that they desire right so we can think a lot about ourselves and we can even put talent in place to achieve what we achieved yesterday and then our customers really dictate mm -hmm. uh, where your next move might be so t to be a uh, best in class company obviously uh, you have to be customer centric. Sure. Yeah, and you're probably of, of the guys here, probably have the lowest staff, but maybe yeah. what are some of your challenges now as you've seen the growth? Well, you know, we started as a lean startup company. Sure. So, I mean, funding was, was an issue, but we tried to keep our costs as low as possible, the right. overhead. So, um, it's just for us and our company, it's getting it out to the market and letting people know we exist. Sure. Uh, when they find that we have a product that actually serves a need, you know, I don't, we don't have anyone that says it's a bad idea. So it's just getting in front of people. The marketing side has been really tough for us. The dollars that go into marketing to get out to the people, um, that's been the biggest challenge for us. And that's a really good point. I think even probably for some of the more established here, they're, they're recreating, the re-innovating, the constant need for new products, services, meet the demands of your customer. I, I got to believe that's a huge challenge and, and probably something you look at every day. We do look at it every day and, and we do our strategic planning in uh, three month increments mm. and then we're projecting out as far as uh, six years um, in those, in those uh, nine or 30 day, or excuse me, 90 day uh, programs. Um, and we're constantly looking to reinvent ourselves. And what we start with is, what do we do well? What do we want to do, and what don't we do well? And how do we shed the stuff that we don't do well, or improve upon it, and then how do we move into the things that we really want to do with the stuff that we already do? Right. And so we're not reinventing the wheel so much as we are trying to sculpt the edges to make it a more efficient wheel. Yeah, and you know, one of the things, recreating, re-innovating, and I want to get your thoughts on this, with that comes an increase maybe in technology, which in, you know, can mean an income, you got to get more income, more revenue, those kind of things. How do you keep up with the, the challenges and the demands of what technology places on your business? Well, <clears throat> we, uh, I think that the best thing you could do there would be to read about it, go to, constantly go to shows about it, and embrace it. Right. So um, I don't know, I'm not, you know, I'm in the technology business, but I'm not necessarily <laughs> an early adopter only because sure. I see, you know, there's so many things that come out right. so quickly. But if you embrace it, uh, if you find out what works best for your company and then you embrace it, you can really save a lot of time and overhead. It seems like a lot going in, but in the end, you can save a lot. Well, so. Matt talked about the money you have to allocate towards marketing and those kind of things, maybe technology. That's a, that's a fine line, right, is balancing the, balancing the books, sure. so to speak. Well, we, you know, obviously we're a service enterprise, mm -hmm. so we don't manufacture anything. And, and our role is really to establish from a marketing standpoint is mechanisms that give feedback from our customers. And when we work with engineers, we're always looking for unmet need, mm. what, what they need. Okay, so, uh, and there are surveys and studies, and we work with the, you know, local university. Notre Dame has uh, uh, programs that, that uh, marketing programs, mm -hmm. and some of their MBA students, we enlist them. Uh, if you were a publicly traded company, you have the funds to right. to do, do a market study. Here, we you know we have a smaller budget to do that, and so we enlist. We want the same output that they might get uh, from a publicly traded company's uh, a marketing uh, uh, engagement. But uh, what we do is we try to make sure that we stay in front of the customer, and, and um, uh, that kind of dictates on our part because uh, they're the ones that are in charge of the R and D. They're the ones that are doing the the engineering, and it's our job to make sure that we understand what their needs are. Mm -hmm. And the mechanisms I talk about putting in place are, you know, a continuous customer loyalty survey, or, you know, uh, you know, maybe six relationships across with your company to that company, a quality relationship with a quality department, uh, uh, your CFO working with uh, their financial folks, uh, engineers working with engineers, and there's many uh, relationships that you can set up you, you know, and you have to have the ability to capture that information and then make something happen with yeah, it. Yeah, it's interesting. You talked about the marketing strategy, marketing budget. What is a successful model for you? Is social media an easy, maybe relatively inexpensive way to do it? Yeah, we, we do use social mm -hmm. media a lot. Um, you know, through our website, uh, you know, we sell a lot throughout the world, really, Australia, England, uh, you know, Israel, we're all over. So, uh, yeah, I mean, using those outlets like Twitter, <laughs> <laughs> Facebook, sure. um, yeah, those are great for us. You know, Absolutely. What's interesting, all of you guys, I've gotten emails from all of you at some point where it's, you know, time stamped at 12.30 in the morning, 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> the time management, big issue here, right? How do you manage your, you got to wear a lot of hats. Yeah, time management for any entrepreneur can be 
a massive undertaking, uh, particularly if the type of personality that they are is one that they're very focused on mm -hmm. their job. Uh, you still have to eat, you still have to sleep. Uh, it's important to see the kids. Um, <laughs> you, you need to, uh, you need to uh, be engaged in outside of work. And that, that management process of time management is just as critical as, as managing any other aspect of your business. Now one of the uh, uh, mantras that I picked up years ago after, after going through Stephen Covey training, uh, you know, his idea was sharpen the saw. You have to take time off to mm -hmm. sharpen the saw. And one of the mantras that I picked up years ago was wherever I am, that's where I need to be. And I have to allow myself to uh, take time off, I, whether that's seeing my son play a baseball mm -hmm. game or whether it's to you know, take a walk or whatever it is that I need to do, mow my lawn. Right. Whatever it is that I need to do, wherever, I'm, wherever I am at that moment, that's where I'm allowed to be. Yeah, and what's interesting, I want to get your thoughts because you went through this where you had enormous growth, got a lot of recognition, much deserved. I have a lot of respect for you, and, you. and the success you've had. But with that comes, we want you on this board, we want you on that board, we want you engaged. So time management, probably as you grow, probably a big issue. Uh, absolutely, but I couldn't have said it better. Um, be in that moment. Uh, sure. some, of, some of my mentors over time had told me that, you know, the most successful people are the ones that can focus on that moment. So you're, you're in that moment. So if you're on a board, <clears throat> you know, you, first of all, be prepared, right. you know, do, do your work wherever you're going to do that, but be prepared. But when you get there, be in that moment. And that'll be the most efficient thing you could do at the office, in your fear in meetings. There's so much time that you can make up by preparing for a meeting holding to uh, right. uh, time management within that. So. You know, Jim, it's interesting. He brought up something I think it's really interesting. I know you're involved in a lot of the peer-to-peer -peer stuff, but he talked about having a good mentor. I think probably for a lot of you, just having another person you can lock arms with to say, hey, this is what I'm going through. You know, let's talk about it. Yeah, I, I belonged for nine years to a CEO group, mm -hmm. and um, it was a global group. Uh, it was called Tech. Now it's called Vistage. And um, the, um, the group that I belonged to was in Indianapolis. And Basically, what we did is shared issues that, sure. that we all had, and then, um, you know, the structure was set so that uh, each member had to come prepared with uh, an, an issue that they might have, and the group would help process that issue. So you had a board. The idea was you had a board of uh, your peers, sure. um, and I thought that that was really helpful for me, especially uh, uh, in the earlier stages. Uh, because you know you wear many hats as an entrepreneur and a small businessman as you professionalize we bring technical more professional folks in that, that focus on a more narrow band of responsibility and um, the entrepreneur owner doesn't still care so he's always got his hand in the every piece of that and uh, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, support groups help from the standpoint that uh, it's tough for other people who are non-owners or people that may not have the same level of responsibility as you do to help you process uh, things. And many times you might think that you're being, uh, uh, you know, erratic or, you know, um, you're so focused that, um, you know, you need to, you need to chill out. <laughs> right. but, but really it boils down to it's an important issue that needs to be resolved. And I think the entrepreneur does a pretty good job about making sure that they continue to work on it until it's solved. Well, you started, Matt, you started your product from ground up, just you, right? So you didn't yeah. have a little bit of that, but how did you get started and, and maybe the thought process behind how you got started? Well, I was a college basketball coach and we had a soccer ball kicked in our athletic facility and it ripped a sprinkler head off with a, a guard like that. Right. Um, so, you know, through that we lost our gymnasium and, and the college had an issue with that. So I came up with a design that had never existed before. Um, so yeah, ground up, I'm, I'm the baby, so to speak, uh, of the panel here uh, as far as my years of experience. But, um, you know, I just want to touch on what he was talking about sure. with, with the checks and balances. I believe that's as a young entrepreneur, mm -hmm. I've tried to put people in my life that are already experienced in what I'm going through and will be going through. I think that's, that's huge for young entrepreneurs to hook up with people that have already walked that road right. and, and draw from them. And that's, that's helped exactly. me try to kind of sidestep some sure. things. And I, you know, we've, we've had our valleys, but uh, having someone there to help you through, I think is key. What, what's the product look like today? I'm curious. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an got industrial strength. a lot of guys strength. you can sell to yeah. right here. They all have warehouses. I didn't so. bring my checklist. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. We can work on that. It's, it's an industrial strength sprinkler head guard. And the main difference between what was really out there, uh, if sprinkler heads are guarded at all, they're guarded with something similar to this guard. 
guard here, which I, I affectionately call a bird cage. I mean, it's, right. it does really nothing for you. It attaches directly to your sprinkler head, which creates a, a leverage point that if hit, it would snap the head off and really just a larger target for that student that says, hey, I wanna, I wanna see what will happen. Right. We've had that happen. We created a guard that actually attaches to the line. Um, we've went through all our UL processes. We have patents on our designs. And uh, I had one gentleman in the fire suppression industry tell me that in 100 years of fire suppression, no one's come up with anything like this. There's nothing out there like what we've come up with. So we started in 2009. We've, we're, you know, we're six years in. And uh, you know we're working with companies like Coca-Cola sure. and Home Depot, and it's growing daily. Th that is such a classic example of an entrepreneur, correct? Sure, absolutely. I mean, identifying That's a need and then differentiating yourself from another person. How hard is it to to look at that, how do we differentiate ourselves kind of thing? Well, I, I think it's important for any entrepreneur to look at that and say, all right, what makes us different? You know, uh, the, the issue I get, or the question I get most of is, how do you deal with your competition? I, differ, I deal with my competition by, quite frankly, not focusing on my competition. <laughs> right. I, focus on, I focus on our plan. This, sure. is where, this is the company we want to be. This is where we want to go. And when, I, when we talk about doing differentiation of products or solutions that we have for our clients, we really focus on, hey, wouldn't this be cool? Right. Like, like, <laughs> this, like your device. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't this be cool? Would this serve a need? And then uh, is there a marketplace for mm -hmm. it? And can we, can we take it to market? Uh, I try not to focus on my competition uh, other than to differentiate myself with, from them because I don't want them to take me off my game. Right. You know, uh, I, I have to play my game, they have to play theirs. I want to be aware of them. Right. I, want to be, I want to be cognizant of where they might be in the marketplace, but I can't let them take me off of my game. Yeah, got about four minutes left. I want to get your thoughts on this because Coach Matt, Matt and I are uh, we coach basketball and we believe in John Wooden who said, yeah. I never scouted any teams, I scouted our own team to get better. I mean, is that is this a philosophy here? Yeah, I think small companies, you know, uh, your customers kind of let you know what they want from you, and then sure. then the whole idea is you're, you you might develop a niche. So when you go out and you look and say, hey, these guys are competitors, you know, it's it's always difficult because say at what level, what what they may do some similar processes, but they really don't. When you look at how you differentiate yourself, they may not do what you do, right. and what we in our business do is. We started out as a consultative approach to the engineers, mm. and then they call on us. Uh, and if we did a good job, we got the process. Right. We got to process parts, and so that's that's what kind of differentiates us. It's not a commodity; it's more of a uh, sure. knowledge source for engineers. Yeah, that's, that's more. What, Dan? In, in about three minutes, I want to give both your thoughts on this advice to helping people get started. I, I want to get your thoughts on this because we talked about a lot of the challenges, a lot of overcoming the risk. If you're a young entrepreneur, what advice do you have to someone that wants to start a business? Well, um, I think that the best thing they could do is build that plan. Mm. So know exactly where they want to go, build that plan, um, be willing to take risks, and know the market. Don't, don't let your competition steer you or get you off your game, but understand who they are and where they play a role in the, in the marketplace so you, you know how you need to play and then take that risk. Yeah, how big of a deterrent is funding? You talked a little bit about funding. I mean, a lot of people have great ideas, maybe don't have capital behind yeah. it. I want to get the, the, your yeah, thoughts Yeah, it, it, well. can, it can be a big deterrent. It, it held us up for the first year and a half mm -hmm. or so. They're just trying to get, get, out, get out there and get sure. going. Um, but there are plenty of things out there, you know, if, if they'll just put a plan together like he's talking about. And I would think just stay with what you're doing there. Have mm -hmm. peace in what you're doing um, and don't deviate. Don't look at the competition so much that you, you forget what you're doing over here. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it can be difficult. Capital, is it a big deterrent? It can be. Uh, I, in addition to the other things that I do, I, I'm a board of trustees for the National Small Business right. Association. And in their most recent survey, 36% of small business owners surveyed said that their primary source of funding was their credit card. Oh, wow. Uh, which wow. is obviously very expensive sure. and, and obviously limited. That's expensive money. Uh, it's very expensive. Yeah. And, and it, is a, it is a limiting factor for a number of entrepreneurs starting out. So my advice to an entrepreneur starting out is, in addition to Dan's coming out, getting that plan together, is understand where the funding is going to come from. Is it is it coming from the boat payment that you're not going to make? Is it coming from a, a relative? Is it coming from wherever? Know where that's coming from. Yeah, and you're one of the most talented gym individuals I've come across because you have a CPA background, finance background, and you look at this really closely. Is it a big deterrent, a lot of what you want to do and get, get accomplished? Well, I, I think that, you know, we're a mature company, so it's kind of unfair to the startup. Sure. Okay, so from that standpoint, we can leverage assets. Uh, we can leverage our history. Right. And we can go to markets and talk about uh, our strategic plan 
and assuming that uh, you know it meets the criteria, public there's uh, uh, publicly um, private equity sure. and other types of funding that's available. Uh, but at the end of the day, you still have to you know you have to be good stewards of what you're going to do with the money. Right. So you know yeah, money is available uh, and it's it's a it's a precious commodity. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you have to treat it that way. Well, it's a great discussion. I, I thank all of you. I have so much respect for everyone here at the table. I mean, you guys are all personal friends, but as well as successful business owners. So thanks uh, for all you're doing. Thank and you. Thank you. Appreciate the good advice. And we'll just leave your cell numbers with all of our people. If they had any questions, we'll just have them call you. Now, I appreciate it, guys. Sure. That's all for this week's program. WNIT thanks you for watching each and every week. We invite you to like us on Facebook and check us out at WNIT.org. I'm Phil D'Amico. Have a great week, everybody. This WNIT local production has been made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.